three. All right. The other morning, I posted a little. What would it be? A post? Is that what I posted? Yeah, it'll be okay. a post. The other morning, I posted a, a little brief statement with some photographs about basically having already come up with the equation to deal with the superluminal neutrino. So I thought, rather than just having these messy chalkboard images on my website, we'd go over them. So let's, let's do that. Um, what we have here, this is basically a three dimensions of time worked out in a, just a three dimensional Cartesian coordinate system with T1, T2, T3, our three dimensions of time. Uh, T1 being linear or period, period, this is what I'm calling this dimension of time, period, it's an ordinary uh, linear time, forward, backwards in time. Um, T2, which is uh, sort of pointing away from the chalkboard more directly at you, if you will, that's the present dimension of time. And then vertically we have uh, passage, uh, treatment of these three dimensions of time and how I come to them is uh, more easily found in the Existics 101 PDF that you can find at Existics101.com. So not to go over a bunch of material, let's just go ahead and move on. So basically this is three dimensions of time and this is the trans delineation of the Existics equations from the identity matrix into a three-dimensional time coordinate system that ultimately becomes a matrix of its own, um, having to do with the chronic or delta applied to existics. So what we have here is this point represents in linear time uh, two, two objects, two observers, two things interacting in linear time. This would be where the one that's experiencing a faster rate of time where they are in that uh, extra dimension of time and where they are in relation to the other individual object or thing and where it is given that it's got a slower passage of time where it is where it's trailing behind relative to the other so and then these are the three uh, tensors that represent the, the these three vectors, the vector relative to the individual with the faster passage of time, the tensor corresponding to linear time, and the tensor corresponding to the passage of time relative to the individual who's experiencing with a slower passage. So these are the three tensors. Um, here's the partial derivative equations um, to derive those. The middle one, which we associate with the linear time, this is where the chronic or delta is. So as you can see with A over B, if this is one, meaning that A and B are the same, experiencing the same relative rate of time, then we're not going to do this, this transformation here. So, so basically this just ends up being A over B equaling one. Then the tensor corresponding to the linear time for A and B is one. Or if A and B are not the same, then that tensor is zero. And again, say the ratio between A and B is like five. Well, we already know from the existence transformation that this also would equal five. So, so these would subtract out, and that would equal zero. So, so the linear time tensor in three dimensions of time as applied to existence, if I guess that's how I'm going to say this, is consistent with the chronic or delta that we find in both general relativity and special relativity. The main difference is is that as I have this drawn here, this, this would correspond to special relativity, that being that this is a linear time. This doesn't have any type of time dilation. So if we were to uh, add like a curve to this and have it so that the, you know, that the passage of time is now following a curve so that these are now following curves as well, then those tensors would correspond to general relativity. So this identity uh, transformation, shifting the invariance away from an invariance in space and time to an invariance between observers or objects, 
that occupy space time so that the invariances between um, things interacting rather than space time itself being the medium for the invariance by making that shift and doing it in three dimensions of time this is completely consistent with general and special relativity and for example is the Kronecker delta um, now what's interesting is if we take the three dimensions of time and rotate them 90 degrees so that rather than period or linear time moving along the chalkboard that that actually is what is now sticking out and that it's that the present is this way so if we rotate our uh, coordinate system 90 degrees what we end up with is down here and this more or less is a transition of energy states in quantum mechanics with the three dimensions of time and so over here as we have up here linear time where really there ends up being no application of the existence transformation and the invariance is as usual we have the same thing down here where the Hamiltonian uh, for the transition from, from, from energy state A to energy state B, the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator where H dagger and H multiply together equal one, so they're unitary, so there is no loss of energy or addition of energy in the transition of, of states from A to B. However, with existence and using the three dimensions of time, this can allow for, not through period, but through present, a distribution of energy states. And, and the existence equations would give us these, these different variations off of the Hamiltonian being a Hermitian operator and, having, and being unitary. Rather, we can have the Hamiltonian without Hermitian, which these are examples of and it doesn't have to be unitary, which this is an example of. And what's interesting is by spreading the energy states across present rather than period, what we're actually showing is the probability wave distribution. So more or less, the existence equations in three-dimensional time applied to either the Lorentz transformation, as I'll show in a minute, or turned 90 degrees and applied to the Hamiltonian is the same set of equations. So now I like to present the argument that it's not that quantum mechanics and general relativity are in contradiction, rather in three dimensions of time they are orthogonal or perpendicular or 90 degrees off center from each other. So simply applying either of them with the same equations to three dimensions of time and then rotating the coordinate system you, you get either quantum mechanics or general relativity. So now applying this to deal with the, new, the superluminal neutrino come over here. So with this little, this little drawing here is this guy okay but now we're applying it to the neutrino. So let's, we're going to go ahead and assume that the neutrino moves at the velocity of light. But that the problem is, is the neutrino has mass. So if we look up here, we've got the tensor that applies to, this would be the, the neutrino having a super luminal, ob, observing the super luminal aspects of the neutrino. And as we have observed it, this is relative to the sender, so relative to the one sending the neutrino. They're seeing it travel at speeds greater than the speed of light. However, uh, the ones receiving it are, ex are experiencing that they're seeing the neutrino travel, if not the speed of light, less than the speed of light. So that would correspond to this tensor, which corresponds again to the, uh, the one that's whose passage, experience of the passage of time is slightly behind the linear time. So, what we have is both observations. Right now, they're arguing whether it's moving faster than light, whether it's moving slower. I'm arguing it's moving both, but it depends on whether or not you're sending or receiving. And there's another technicality here that has to do with what I call cross-symmetry. And that has to do with how the, the symmetry between matter and antimatter 
as far as neutrinos go is, is for instance, in beta decay, we find matter coupled with an anti-neutrino or anti, in anti-beta decay, we find a neutrino coupled with anti-matter. So there's something that has to be modified here but more or less, this is what I predicted would happen in my essay I wrote in 2003 titled The, twin, the Adjusted Twin Paradox. And what that uh, anticipated was there should be a situation where we have a particle where from one perspective it arrives early, but from another perspective it arrives late. And that's just a demonstration of the extra... the extra... Of, not affect the extra having to account for an extra aspect of reference frames when they're relative to one another and one's uh, going at a different rate than the other for instance to observers experiencing more than one rate of time okay so real quickly go ahead and go back to this um, so if you look here this tensor here that corresponds to something um, at, that's moving at a faster rate of time relative to linear time, which we're going to have go along with the superluminal luminal neutrino. If we basically uh, move the square from here and just square root the, the side of the equation, what we end up with is more or less this. And what this is saying is that the time for the, the base state of the neutrino, or the neutrino relative to itself, or at a base state, so basically with no time dilation, so the time relative to the neutrino with no time dilation, as it's transitioning to its next state, equals the square root of the, the time dilation of the neutrino, the extra luminal aspect of the neutrino, if you will, which is represented by bold A, so the partial derivative of bold A with respect to period or linear time, so the change in the passage of the rate of time relative to the neutrino uh, in relation to period um, minus the time aspect of mass tells us that the neutrino, no, the neutrino is not moving faster than the speed of light. The neutrino just simply is doing what it does, I'm thinking maybe, you know, probably moving it at the speed of light. But because it has mass, there's this extra thing happening that general relativity, I'm sorry, special relativity doesn't account for. And so it appears to be going faster than light. But it isn't, so once you account for it properly, we find out that, no, it's just doing what it's supposed to. It's just our equations need a little bit more tinkering. And so what's really cool about this is when we go back to the Kronecker delta right here, where A over B, if A over B equals 1, we just go with this, so on and so forth. Looking at the Kronecker delta and keeping in mind the way I created the Kronecker delta is real simple. If you look up here on this tensor, you've got A. On this tensor, you've got B. So obviously maintaining the ratios that come out of the existence equations, we're going to have A over B, just like this. And the question becomes, of, well, what do we do about sines? Because we have a minus here, a plus here. Well, since we have n star minus i in the numerator here, we're going to go ahead and use the minus sign up here. And likewise, since, since B is associated with being in the denominator, and because B, there's a reverse time aspect to B, which I'm not going to get into now, but we're definitely going to get, going to get into later, I, I, there isn't a, the minus sign here that would go up here isn't here because of this that I just referred to, and we, we're going to use the minus sign up here. That being said, when you come over here, and just seeing this is okay, this is the Kronecker delta as far as this application of existence goes. If we then reverse this, so we're going to multiply a minus sign through, what happens is we swap these two around, so then 
the n star minus i over i minus u star is actually having a over b subtracted from it. And then if we bring the square root over like we did over here, or like how it is here, and if we keep in mind that b is in the denominator, it becomes real obvious that the chronic delta in the existing equations is the Lorentz transformation. So right away the fact that the tensor that I have associated with linear time is associated, or I'm sorry, I can derive from it, the Lorentz transformation shows exactly how consistent the existing transformation is with special relativity because when things are happening in a manner that doesn't require the existing equations, the special relativity equations are fine, and so I can just leave everything normal by just having the chronic delta equal 1, so then the Lorentz transformation does quite fine. However, when the Lorentz transformation doesn't provide adequate mathematics for us, such as with the you know apparent superluminal neutrino, that's when we'll use this tensor. Or, in the case of something like dark matter, or possibly the, the anomalous, para, para, the anomalous uh, orbit of Mercury, we would use this tensor. But that's, that's for a whole other subject. I just wanted to quickly get out there. Here's the equation for the superluminal neutrino.